Welcome everyone, welcome to Office Hours with Michael Kitsis. So I'm here today with Jason Carroll. Jason is with Live Oak Bank. And for those of you who are familiar, Live Oak Bank does financing for advisor mergers and acquisitions. Like when you're buying a practice, selling a practice, and that question always comes up of like, yeah, but can people finance it? Like how do they pay for it? Like this is the guy who answers how you pay for it. So a little bit of a new format for some of you to see me here doing an interview with someone, uh, since I'm usually talking to you directly but honestly, this is a space that I actually have not spent a ton of time on, so I wanted to get someone here uh, who can actually talk about it. So, Jason, can you give like a little bit of background of just Live Oak Bank? Like, where do you guys come from? Because, like, no offense, I don't, I don't feel yeah, like you're yeah. a household name in, in what do most advisors know in the banking world. Yeah, so high level. Um FDIC insured national footprint bank. I guess I'll look okay. b- between you and the. Community. Yeah, sure. Um, we're all figuring it out. <laughs> um, so we're a specialty lender. Right now, we only lend to ten industries: veterinarians, okay. dentists, uh, doctors, things like that. And so, like pr- professional services. Professional that's services. kind of your yes. your niche in banking. Yeah, professional services typically. Okay. Unlike other banks, very cash flow heavy. So advisor okay. businesses, no, not a lot of collateral inventory. Right, like and that. that's that's always been historically like why it's hard to get. Lending, I think, for advisory firms, you go to a bank like, I'd like to borrow a couple million dollars. They go, awesome. Tell us about your collateral. I'm like, "Um, my clients like me a lot. Right. (laughs) My clients are very sticky is what you hear. Right, right. Yeah, we're not buying them. So, um, And that's a good point because technically, um, Live Oak Bank was um, founded in 07. We got our FDIC charter in 2008. Okay. And what's important about it is our charter is specifically written to allow for collateral shortfalls when we lend. Okay, so, so you don't have to have hard collateral. asset collateral, right. that's yep. okay. Yep, so we're not lending to John Deere from putting a lien on a bunch of tractors. Right. We lean on and what we were cash flow lenders and okay. depend on the goodwill relationship that advisors have okay. with their clients. We can only lend on the independent side, so that's another differentiator. Okay. Um, so in independent RAs, folks at independent broker dealers yes. to just functionally, I guess you have to you have to own your business. You have to actually own the cash flow if you're an employee advisor. Yeah. Technically, you don't own that, so you can't borrow money right. against it. So uh, not Morgan, not Merrill, they're W two right. employees, so right. not that side of the world. Um, but we do lend for RAAs, registered okay. reps, hybrids, okay. whatever those may. So on the independent okay. side, so. Um, I started the group in 2012 when I joined the firm. Um, I left Charles Schwab, where I would okay. manage all the institutional lending platforms at Schwab. Um, <clears throat> timely that we were having this conversation, we just crossed yep. over $300 million in lending to advisors since. Wow. Um, we did our first loan in February of 13, so give or take. So you're living kind of the uptick of advisor M&A activity, all the stuff we've been talking about in industry studies of merger and acquisitions, yep. like you're at the center of that. Yep. So um, 65% of that number, 300 million, mm-hmm. is um, succession and acquisition, which succession is a, part, a type okay. of acquisition. Anyway. So, so basically uh, either internal succession plans yeah. or external succession plans. Yeah, and then we differentiate it a step further too as well. So like Ameriprise buying Ameriprise, to, to us that would be internal acquisition. Okay, okay. Um, so internal within the broker dealer. Mm-hmm. So if you're at Ameriprise LPL, one of those, you want to buy other advisors in the platform, yeah. you're a financing option. Or external Ameriprise buying Cetera, for example. Okay. Or RAAX buying RAAY. Okay. We do a lot in um, recruiting and recruiting growth. Um, okay. So, well, for example, the wirehouse advisor that wants to transition and start their RAA. Uh, we have a forgivable note. Uh, can you help me with that? We have, we have. Oh, interesting. So, like, I'm. I want to break away. My problem is I've got a forgivable loan from a retention deal from a couple of years ago, and I don't want to pay the lump all at once, or I maybe not even have the liquidity to pay the lump all at once. So you'll you'll finance my you'll finance the repayment of my forgivable loan against my own client cash flows from my breakaway. A couple different yes, but a couple different ways I would, that happens. No so. offense, to them. I, I would imagine some there there are some broker dealers that created forgivable loans who are not actually thrilled that you're making it easier for that well, I'm not, transition. I'm not thrilled that there's other banks in the country. Oh, either, right, but, you know, amen. Competition is what it is. Competition is what it is. Um, no, so we do that on a smaller scale. Mostly what we get is okay. the advisor that wants to transition, whether it's what I'm not picking on wirehouses. So <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. No. Maybe it's a wirehouse or moving from LPL to another platform. 
And as they move, it's going to take three to six months to transition their clients, and they're not going to have right. money or bill through the custodian or whoever they're Right, because just through. literally there's no cash there. flows coming in while your clients are transferring. Right, so we will capitalize their new business. Okay. So whether that's on the forgivable side or not, but we'll capitalize okay. their business to operate their business. Someone t typically is not going to take a seven-year note on, as a forgivable and call us six months into it and say, hey, can you, can you bail right, me out? Right, they're not, right, That's not. But, you know, you had a seven-year forgivable and you got three years to go and you kind of want to transition and you don't want to wait until the end of the three years, but you don't want to write the check all at once. Yeah. That's kind of the scenario. So we do play a lot with just advisors in motion in, okay. ge in general. So whether that's forgivables or operating capital, working capital, uh, recruiting, like as a tuck-in, I'm an R RIA, um, XYZ, okay. and I custody with uh, Pershing, and I'm going to recruit someone from a, r a broker dealer, yep. from a wirehouse, from another wirehouse, and that's or from another RIA. That's right. where we get into more of the succession. Okay. So why, w how are you going to fund or find Generation Two that's going to run a sustainable yeah. business for you? I, he has a small book of business. I'm going to bring them as a tuck in under me, and that's how I'm going to start to execute my okay. succession plan. And so, can we talk numbers a little bit? I mean, like, what is, what does a financing deal look like? I'm going to presume you still require. You know, you won't finance 100% of a deal. There's probably some kind of down payment. So, well, like, what, what does that look like of down payments and interest rates and, you know, loan durations? Yeah. What's if, if there's a typical? Yeah, there is. So, we'll just talk about acquisition and success. Okay, days. okay. Um, typical 10-year fully amortizing term loan. Okay, so um, no, no balloons. No like, balloons. you were going to pay your payments over time. He and I over time. Okay. Monthly. Um, down payment percentages vary, 25% uh, to where we can do up to 100% financing. So you'd okay. say, well, that seems like a wide range, and it is. If you and I, who just met, just started to, we, I know we've met, but yeah. this person and yes. I who just met um, says, I want to sell you my business, and I need the bank, I'm going to fund more on that 25% range because uh. of attrition risk. Right, right. Versus You're concerned that just literally, you know, you're collateralizing with cash flows that may or may not successfully transition they, at the end of the day. Right, and they don't know that new advisor and all that stuff. Right. So um, attrition risk, we try to mitigate. Then that compared to daughter buying dad's practice, who's been there for 20 years, he's out on the golf course, very small attrition risk. She's running the office. I could go up to 100%. So it really depends on... Yeah risk mitigation on either side of the transaction. So so in practice then, I guess the, uh, like your primary underwriting risk on M&A, well, which I guess makes sense, but your primary underwriting risk is basically client retention. Like how, how good is your goodwill really? Cause yep. that's what we're lending against. And that's what we want to understand. We say how long you've been working together. Have you met that top tier list of clients? Is there a good, you know, a similar investment philosophy, culture, or things like that, you know, and they, if it's no, again, we just met at the bus stop last yeah. night, a little more risk. And our buyers don't want to take on that yeah. risk either. So we really no. work very consultatively with our folks and say, you know, you're, 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 you're exposing yourself to risk here. I think one differentiator on Live Oak as well, all, um, everyone on the team only does investment advisory loans. So we're okay. not financing a pizza parlor one day, a laundromat the next. Right, and, like and you, trying to figure you out what live advisory advisor. businesses that's and how it. they work. Yeah, and so we, come, we become consultative in nature because that's all that we do. And, and so, I, so I guess the, your, your strength of relationship with clients and kind of your confidence in transition them now uh, basically gets reflected twice in the deal because, of course, those are like the core factors for valuation in the first place. That's right. And then it affects the underwriting of the financing as well in terms of both down payment. I mean, like, does that impact your interest rate that you charge as no. well? No. So we're not risk-based pricers, right? Okay. So, so um, everybody gets the same rate? Yeah, it's roughly prime plus two, prime plus two and a half. We don't Which, get commissions either. Prime's okay. three and a half. Prime's three and a half. So, so six we're at six and a half. So, okay. So and six remember, to, it's a business so. loan. Even if it's a registered rep, it's a business loan because they're sole proprietors. Yep. So you're writing that interest off on your taxes every year. Cause okay. Your right. So it's... Pretty tax cheap. deductible financing, so six to six and a half pre-tax minus your deduction, you know, do your tax rate math. And from a down payment perspective, we like to see equity, but if I'm buying your shop, I have a hundred million in AUM, hundred million in AUM, you have a hundred million in AUM. Yep. I'm kind of already bringing my equity to the table, yeah. right? Versus if it's a junior buying out the senior, you know, so, but we don't, we don't have some you have to put 10% down, we'll okay. fund up to the remaining 40%, yeah. and then the rest is on a seller note. It's not done like that. Okay. Typically, these deals are structured that 
what we don't finance are finance with a seller note, but it's not. So you actually, the, so it is, I guess I would say common, or it's not uncommon to end out with basically a blended financing. The, the seller will seller finance some, and then you guys finance the rest. So who, 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 who who's in order there? Yeah, like yeah, well, I, hopefully, of course, nobody's transaction goes south, right. but were it to hypothetically go south, like who stacks up where? Well, we're for, the bank's always first, so of course. we're always first in the position. Um, <laughs> but the seller... So that's why he's a good banker, because the banker goes first. The, the, the point of why, why a seller note? Well, a seller note is because they want some extended capital in their pocket. That's fine. Okay. They're getting paid back. But Do they sometimes take earnouts and things like that as well? So Does that become part of the driver? Based. That's what it is. is so okay, so the so the seller takes a seller note. The bad news is they're secondary. The good news is they're maybe on an earnout basis or performance basis. So they've yeah. got upside skin in the game as yeah, well. Yeah, we have guys that say, "I want to sell my business, but I don't want to exit." Okay, so sell, have a liquidity event at a okay. time where it makes sense, where the value of your yep. firm's still going up. But I want to help out during heavy time, tax season. Yeah. Um, I still want to get paid if I refer business to the firm. Cool. Yeah. I um, um, I want to be paid as a, a employee at will. Yeah, just That's any of those. Just give up I want to hang around, give yeah. up the ownership. You finance the, but the I want transaction. Event. Yeah. And I guess I, I mean I just think about it like, I mean, getting really rough on numbers. You know, if I have some practice that does a million dollars of uh, revenue and it's pricing at something like two million dollars. If I start going through, you know, my profits off of that business uh, is probably more than enough to finance a note if I'm actually spreading oh, this yeah. note out over ten years. So like, your your my your notes. deal is cash flow like for the buyer. My deal is cash flow positive from day one. Yeah, probably not by a huge margin once we take some taxes out yeah. of it. But yeah, and that's and they you know we encourage to work with attorneys to work with folks yeah. around what are the tax implications on the sellers. Um, and do all those different types of things. But we really want to make sure that just risk overall is mitigated. Yeah. We, it's a shared risk between the buyer and the seller. Um, yeah. And then there's performance measures and say, look, mostly from a nutrition factor, how many clients are still with the firm versus they've left the firm, this, that, and the other. And are there consequences for me as the, there could be. the buyer that did financing with you if we're not hitting some of the not attrition me. metrics? No, not so with you, so just with the seller? Yeah, we your... don't have um, covenants. Okay. We don't have, so our $200 million yep. combined, I'm going to call the loan if you drop below 180. Can't okay. do it, don't want to do it. Right. Not in there. Now, if you're my hundred million that you just bought from me mm -hmm. drops down to eighty, drops down to seventy. Yeah. There's high attrition factors. By the way, you're under right. non-compete, non-solicit. Yeah. So you can't call my clients, take my money, and leave the next day. Um, so all those attrition factors are in okay. these buy-sell agreements when we do them. And how does the value? Like, do you do the valuation as well? I'm thinking classically, like, okay, I want to sell the FD asset. Like, I need financing. I need a clear valuation because yeah. you're going to want to validate the valuation as well as your underwriting of the risk. Right. So, so we have a short does... list of valuation companies okay. that specialize in the industry. I don't want to say them, say them because if I say them, it looks like I'm partial to sure. one. Sure. Well, I, I guess we can at least yeah. point out, like, not a coincidence right next to us here is FP Transitions. Good, I'll, par uh, good partners. I'll guess yeah. that would be one of the partners. Obviously, there's a couple other folks yeah. out there that do but valuations. We firms that, that are qualified and yep. do, um, that have a focus on the financial services industry. We get well. My my brother's a CPA. He's going to help us out. And okay, I, right. So like I'll you pay for another one. To be done. Yeah, you don't want it outside, but you know, FP Transitions, Gladstone, DeVoe, SRG. Like there's a bunch out yeah. there that that do valuations that know how to price the firms yeah, in the industry. And you mentioned is on and, our shortlist. And they uh and and like you take their valuation kind of as gospel. Like if they say this is the valuation, that's the valuation we're financing against. Yeah. And then you do your risk based assessment of how much you'll lend against that number? Yeah, typically these valuations come back in a range. Okay. So, you know, right. it is a range, and so we can lend within that range. Okay. We do have buyers that say we want to buy above that range, but okay. it's just like you buying a house. I'm the bank. I'm not giving you more than what yeah. the house is worth. Yeah, but yeah. if you want to do that, that's your Yeah, you want, you want to do that, yeah. you can take that seller yeah. note, and you two can work that yeah, out. That's, right. that's, that's, that's exactly right. That's your problem because you're because not financing 105% of... Right appraised value basically the most important factor in these deals is the discounted cash flow because that's what yep. pays back your investment well valuation is done at a point in time yep. not a future looking which is right. how a buyer is looking and say well how long is it going to take to pay back my investment right. that's what they're more interested in and that's what i'm more interested in is what's it right. going to look like going forward that's why we want a strategy in place of how you're going to make sure the clients move from one platform to another 
Are we repapering? Are we changing investment philosophies? All those things that cause ripples yep. in the water, we want to mitigate as much as we can. And typical deal sizes, like how, how small do you go? How big do you go? So our typical, our average size right now is right at about 900000 so that's, that's, of, that's of our value financing. value of the practice. No, our financing. Oh, your financing yeah, portion. Our financing. Okay. So let's say that that equates to, as you said, a one point eight million dollar deal. Okay. We're financing nine hundred thousand. So nine hundreds are okay. our kind of average. We don't really have a cap. Which I guess is like roughly well fifty percent of a uh, ninety million dollar practice, give there or take go. a little. Yeah, give yep. or take. Yeah. Um, we leverage a few different platforms. We are a publicly traded bank. Um, okay, so I can look up Live Oak Bank, LOB. Live Oak Bank, LOB on NASDAQ. Went public July okay. 23rd. That, so what's that mean? Well, we leverage the SBA platform. Okay, um, Small Business Association. Small Business Association 7A program. Little Live Oak Bank is the second largest SBA lender in the country behind Wells Fargo. Well, um, That said, we don't have to because we're a publicly traded bank okay. and have a bunch of conventional capital. So does... At like from the advisor end, do I do I care at the end of the day about whether you go through SBA or not? Like, does does that change the terms to me, or is it just you're a bank, you work out your capital sources? I just care that I get my ten year note at Prime Plus. Mostly, that's the problem three. because I wouldn't enter if it's a program like, for example, a succession partial mm-hmm. buy in is something that the industry really wants and needs. Yep. So you, the SBA rules don't allow partial buy in. Okay. For the juniors to buy out the senior, and they want to buy ten percent the first year or whatever. So oh, so, the, like, so those staged the succession deals, which is so common for internals, like yep. rarely is it all at once. Yeah. Can't do that via SBA, so that's okay. where I would come in conventionally okay. and give those slugs of capital. And then, and you guys literally hold the hold the loans in your own portfolio. Service, yeah, we service all the loans. Okay. It has to do with the SBA kind of platform, but we do okay. own and service all the loans. Okay. Um, we get 90-day financials from all of our clients. Okay. Um, so, no, I don't know that a, a bar, it's transparent. We're preferred and designated by the SBA, so we make all our decisions in-house. Okay. Um, but, again, that's one platform that we lend on. Okay. We can lend conventionally as well. Uh, that has to do with me as a banker as risk-weighted capital and right. things, what makes the most sense, where okay. are we at risk. So with you know the FDIC and now the SEC looking yes. at us and everybody else, we have to make good sound judgments yep. and things like that. But, but um, And how, how, how big can you get on the well, that's upside? The, or that's why we don't, the SBA program has a $5 million cap. Okay. But if it was a $10 million deal, we, there's nothing to say we couldn't do you $5 couldn't million do it SBA internally. and $5 million conventionally. Okay. Yeah. So you know, you're getting up in a multi-billion dollar RAs at that yeah, point that's still, I guess you might not finance 100% of that, but like... Yeah, I, I think, know. let me go back to that, because that's a good point. Our target is not a $10 billion dollar RAA. Yeah. It's about a $75 million in assets versus up to maybe a billion and a half, two billion. Okay. So really, if you look at a triangle, it's not the way bottom number yeah. of, I have 10 million in AUM, nor is it the top, but we, we address that middle, that big, large middle yeah, market. Yeah, 75 million to, billion and a, half, to a billion. billion and a half. So basically you're talking about firms that are probably valuations from a little north of a million up to maybe 15 or 20 million yeah. at the top end. We, not that you're financing all the 20 million deal, but that may not be done all at once anyways. You're, yeah. you're doing, you know, succession deals to junior buyers in tranches over time. And we've done, I'd I'd want to say the largest we've done is about a $2.8 billion AUM shop that we financed. And um, that happened to be, I believe they did the full max on 5 million on SBA, but um, they didn't care, you know. Yeah, okay. We're a very technology and marketing driven bank. um, So our technology platform enables a very fast and efficient process okay. um, that, that gets answers very quickly. We are a bank. We're not a broker. Yep. So, you know, we make our decision. We write our own checks, all those things. So. And and last question is, what does timeline typically look like? I, I'm interested, or, you know, I'm, I'm talking to someone. We're kind of hammering out a deal. I think we're getting close. Like, at what point do I need to call you yeah. so that I don't, like, screw up the timing of my deal because yeah. I didn't call you early well, enough? Our average is 38 days from when you give me your information to where we wire money out. Wow, now, that's actually pretty fast. Like I've, fast. I've probably done most of, I've sorted out most of my deal at that point, yeah. probably. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you want to know a couple things. Are you approved and when you get your money? The are okay. you approved actually comes in about 10 days after you've applied. So okay. again, that's the bank. That's the certainty. Okay. You're approved. We have a legal and binding letter that has okay. your name on it, but you have to do a few things first. Okay. So then about 15, 20 days later, which by the way, that's when you're doing your valuation. That's when you're doing your buy-sell agreement, right. all that stuff. That's when all that comes down. 
um, and that there again goes into an average of 38 days. Okay. Some are longer, some are shorter because we're waiting on other external things. Well, I, I can only imagine. I, mean, I know plenty of session deals and yeah. transactions that got delayed for a long list of other reasons, so I'm sure some of those speed bumps come up too. But to get back to your specific question, when yeah. do you call? Call early. Call early. So you'd early. rather be on the radar screen for the discussion just so that they don't do it too late or yeah. mess something else up along mess the way. Mess something up along the way. Right. Don't admit it. Put themselves in a, in a risky situation. Yeah. Even even that. All right. You know. All yeah. right. Well, awesome. And uh, and they find you, I guess, li Live Oak Bank, liveoakbank.com. That's yeah, live pretty straightforward. Yeah, liveoakbank.com, even liveoakbank.com slash advisor. Um, All right, slash advisor. Yeah. Um, yeah, but call us. We have some good, we have a new resource center that we're putting out on the website that has an interactive video. Okay. Which, that talks specifically about tax implications, okay. valuation how deals are getting done. That's going to be out live awesome. within the next two to three weeks, give or okay. take. And it has a bunch of white papers, one pagers on how to get things done, advisors in motion, what yeah, is this about, all, the, all, all those types of things. things. All right. so, awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you very thank much. You Excellent. Good Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Office Hours with Michael Kitsis. Uh, normally 1 p.m. East Coast time. I was running a little bit late today, but uh, Jason was kind enough to visit with us anyway. So hope this was helpful food for thought. And thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks.